Hello, and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Philip Hoare, author of Leviathan, or The Whale, a fascinating blend of natural, social, literary, and personal history. I asked Philip first about the whale as a creature of myth. Well, I think you know that's probably why my book is called Leviathan, which is really the, the biblical name for the whale, and the, that sort of ancient conception of, a, of an animal which is unknown. Because I think really what gripped me in the writing of the book and the whole notion about the whale is that the fact that it cannot be seen, that for most of most of human history, our relationship to the whale has been necessarily mysterious because we humans cannot see the whole of the whale. The whole mis- mystery about a whale, about the way the ancients saw the whale and sort of the whale has been seen up, up until relatively recent times, has been almost like a composite. It's almost like a sort of a jigsaw animal. It's like, almost like a chimera. Um, that's why whales were just depicted with extraordinary monstrous teeth and, you know, this sort of straight, you know, those medieval etchings of whales. So it's really very, very relatively recently that we really do know even what a whale really looks like. Because for centuries, we saw them dead on beaches or we saw them disappearing beneath the waves. So we we had no sort of real fix on them. And so they, they were really in the same category as properly mythical monsters. Absolutely. You know, the distorted way that whales were presented continues right up to the 18th century. Even at the eight, end of the 18th century, the French Academy agreed that there were 15 or 16 different types of sperm whale. So there's only one, but they literally believed that, you know, the, just because from, you know, when, it, when a whale is stranded on a beach, it's like a sort of deflated tyre. It has no sense of its life. And Melville very famously writes about a whale never fully, fair fully floated itself for its portrait. And that he says that the, the whale will remain unpainted to the last. And that's really true. It's really only within uh, the last generation, only really since the 1960s, that we've actually seen whales in their natural element through underwater photography and film. And that we realise exactly what they look like. And whales went from being semi-mythological beings straight to being the objects of the most brutal commerce, didn't they, and, and exploitation. There was, there, was, there was no sort of intervening stage of, of reaching any understanding of them, you know, the, the way you might do with cattle or horses. You know, people, people immediately, as soon as they could get a fix on them, that fix was to exploit them commercially. Absolutely. I mean, whales were regarded very quickly, as soon as man could hunt them, as a resource. They were a God-given resource. Um, the 18th century whalers rationalised their pursuit as being almost a holy pursuit of these animals because they were God-given. And in a way, they were because they were just sort of such magnificent repositories of energy because until the discovery of petroleum in the uh, mid-19th century, most of the Western world was lit from whale oil. And at one point in the book, you enumerated all the products in the 20th century, which were made from whales. And I was astonished by the, the vast range of, of those things. Can you just suggest some of those things? Because there's an astonishing range. Absolutely. Well, within yours and my generation, I mean, certainly our parents wore whale cosmetics. Our, our mothers wore whale cosmetics, lipstick, powder. Photography, the gelatin uh, in, in camera film was made from whale. Munitions were used, uh, whales, uh, nitroglycerin was made from whales. During the First World War, I mean, whales became part of the war process. A, a real irony, given the sort of placidity of these creatures. And even up to the 1960s, when Britain was still whaling, we were still a whaling nation in the 60s, we were still importing sperm whale oil to treat leather. They are tremendously useful creatures, in a way. And that's why it's so recent, our change. I mean, the change from whale hunting to whale watching has been incredibly abrupt. Whale hunting wasn't banned officially worldwide until 1986. So, you know, the same people who who were whale hunting in places like the Azores and Australia, New Zealand, in America, are the same people now who actually are whale watching. It's that recent. Something which came across from your book was that although the whale hunting may have largely stopped, and certainly in the scale that it was going on at its peak... Nonetheless, there are all sorts of remaining threats in the marine environment that are man-made, and they, they may 
ultimately be more threatening than than the whalers. Well, of course, this is the irony: is is that uh, whaling might have stopped, um, except for nations such as Japan and Norway. But the threats, as you say, to whales now are, are, are immense. I mean, they're hit by ships. They get entangled by fishing line. They're affected by global warming, the changes in in their feeding patterns. Anthropogenic noise, the noise made by human beings, not only from traffic, but also from sonar, from military sonar and sonar used for detecting oil, are huge threats to to the whale's well-being. Because, I mean, these are animals which live within an environment of sound. Sound is is the defining um, sense for a whale. So these are serious threats. Going back to the 19th century, it seemed to me that the, that your book would almost be inconceivable without Herman Melville and Moby Dick, and that, that looms large in every sense in the book, and that you were at least as fascinated with him and that book as you are with the, with the whales. Well, I think, as you say, you know, no study of the whale in a, in a cultural or literary point of view could ignore Moby Dick. And Moby Dick is as big as the whale itself. Melville's creation of Moby Dick and Melville's relationship to the whale in that book is absolutely extraordinary. It's one of the reasons why most people actually don't get through the book is because he is so obsessive about the way he treats the whale. He's so digressive in the way he, 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 he describes every aspect of whales and whaling. It really stands still now as the most important document we have on 19th century whaling. Uh, but more than that, for Melville, the whale becomes a metaphor and an allegory for many aspects of certainly 19th century society, uh, a society which, you know, was torn between belief and science, which was riven by the pressures of industrial revolution. He was coming from a, a new republic, which was trying to establish its importance within the world. And it did that through whaling. I mean, really, whaling is America's first global impact, the first global impact it has on the world's economy. For Melville, was torn between writing this a romantic novel, celebrating this great sort of pioneering aspect of, of a new republic, but at the same time, he was very aware that the whale was under threat from this pursuit, and also that for him, it became, I mean, he really is almost a proto-environmentalist in that he sees that the, the greed, the personification of the whale as a resource is ultimately unsustainable. He, he saw that. He saw that um, back in 1851. But he also invests the whale with extraordinary qualities of some kind of metaphysical power. For Ahab, who's pursuing the whale, the whale is impossibly an embodiment of evil. And Melville steps back and says, no, th- this is impossible. No, no animal can, Im- can embody evil. And in a way, that's very analogous to modern times when we invest people or places or ideas with evil. And Melville was really looking forward to those aspects of the modern world, I think.